So you guys see that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So my bird clock says it's time to start the, the Orange Audubon Society um, bird chat. We're glad that all of you are joining us. We have two very, very special guests. And as we're doing the program, if you think of questions, if you look at the bottom of your screen, um, you might even need to run your, your mouse over that part. You should see a little chat and you can type it in uh, your question and Susan will monitor it and then we'll bring those up at the end, okay? So we're gonna start with announcements, plan of the week, the mystery bird, this week in Central Florida birding. And then our program is Hannah and Eric go birding. So upcoming programs, next week we're really excited to feature the Florida Big Year by Natasha Fontaine and Robert Gundy, um, two birders from the Tallahassee area that we got to meet last year. They were um, <clears throat> guides at our, at our festival, um, the North Shore Birding Festival. Really wonderful young couple, very um, enthusiastic about what they were doing and um, they have some good tales to tell. And, and they also are very involved in conservation and working with other types of wildlife too. Um, June 17th is our special uh, program, the uh, Sure Talk Awards program for the, whoops, I'm sorry, for the photography um, contest that we run. And I'll explain a little bit more later. And June 24th, we have a special guest from Alachua County. He's going to do a program on bringing birds to your yard, which is a great thing to do as we're in the summer months. And you might have a little bit more extra time to do that and get ready for the fall. Okay, so we do have some upcoming events this Saturday. We have the June Challenge kickoff field trip at the Orlando Wetlands Park um, featuring Gigi Del Pizzo and Lori Lilja. Um, it's this Saturday, 7 a.m. to about noon. That's $10 uh, suggested donation. Um, you can email me at wrigglingk at aol.com. We still have some space. It's gonna be fun. We're getting out there early so that we can beat the heat. Hopefully we'll have kind of day like we had today that's a little overcast and, and we should really see some really cool things. And then we have our monthly survey. We run all through the year, even in the summer. And actually this photo, actually both these photos I took last week I was scouting. And um, this is at beautiful Kiowa Spring State Park, which is an amazing place. If you've never been, this is a really good way to get to know it. And you might see a fox squirrel, like the one on the left, who was really cooperative last time I went out. And he had a really long tail. I just couldn't fit the tail and the squirrel in the whole picture. And then the red-headed woodpecker, among other things. And the red-headed woodpeckers are really active right now. So email me if you'd like to participate. That's on June 12th. And then um, our normal monthly program is the Sure Talk Florida Native Nat Nature Photo Contest and Silent Auction will be kicking off then. Um, it's going to be, the program will be on our YouTube channel. You can watch it live. It's an amazing program. We have some just fabulous photographers of all different levels, including youth. And online, we're gonna be using the Bidding Owl platform. And you need to uh, watch for uh, the, the Orange, Society, Orange Audubon Society's Facebook page and email blasts www.orangeaudubonflorida.org. You definitely, we got some cool things that are gonna be uh, in the auction and you can help us raise money for our, uh, our, our nature uh, education center that we're working hard to get to. Okay, Deborah's gonna do plant of the week. Okay, thank you. Um, I picked cattails, very abundant plant throughout the country. I, uh, you probably have them in Oregon too. Am I correct? Oops, what did I just do? Um, next slide, please. And there are two species in Florida, the broadleaf cattail, also called the common cattail, Typha latifolia, and the southern cattail, Typha dominguensis. And if you'll see on the left, um, there's, flowers, really tiny flowers in this thing that looks kind of like a hot dog. Um, and the female ones are on the bottom and the male ones are on the top. 
And the difference between these two species is that the southern cattail typha dominguensis has a little space before a really long staminate flower uh, stalk. So notice them when you're out there. These, this is, I took on Lakeside just uh, last week and it looks like this was the, the broadleaf cattail, but both of them are known from out there. Next. And they grow abundantly where phosphorus is in the water. They're even to the point of being a pest, but they have many food uses around the country where they grow. But you, if you're gonna use it for food, use for clean water only. The pollen, is been used in flour and the new shoots are eaten and the, the, the new shoots also can be uh, cooked like asparagus. And this, I got this from foragingtexas.com and has a whole lot of uses. Next. Oops, sorry. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to say is you might notice that the Lake Papa North Shore like on lakeside, it looks like it's been herbicided. The cattails that were there before, yes, it just gets so aggressive that to let other more beneficial species grow, they do do that periodically. I believe they do some processing of some sort at Oakland, um, Orlando Wellens Park too, where it starts clogging the cells. So it, just be aware it's native, but very aggressive, especially when there's nutrients in the water. But on the bird front, it's, it seems to be really a great home for the red-winged blackbirds. And here's a picture Susan Kirby took of a nest of, uh, right there in the cattails. And that's it for the cattails. Now Susan's going to do our mystery bird. We're gonna take you guys up to the Pacific Northwest for our mystery bird. Uh, so this mystery bird is a nice stocky fellow, um, obviously eats fish. Love this picture. Um, go ahead, next. In non-breeding plumage is on the left. And I love this like kabuki look face in the breeding plumage. All right, and both Paula and oh, Taryn, sorry. they puffin. Uh oh, you gave it away. I was gonna make you <laughs> guess which kind. Okay. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And it is a tufted puffin, which is what um, Hannah and Eric get to see on their haystack rock. Um, these are very, they're the largest puffin. They have a black body and a white face. You can see in breeding, they got the orange bill and feet and the great little tufts of um, yellow hair that kind of curl around the nape during pre breeding. So they debreed on rocky islands and beaches, um, but usually they are pelagic. So in the winters, they're out um, on the open ocean, but they do come in for breeding. So you get to see them then. And I would love to see those. And this is kind of the distribution map. I put, um, I put the big map in so you can see it's not just where we just don't have it in the Pacific Northwest, but all over um, going almost as far down as Japan and um, over that way. So we do have more of them, but you can see most of them, they're on the coast during breeding and otherwise they're pelagic in the ocean there. And unfortunately, when I went to visit, it was breeding season. <laughs> And everything was closed, all the tours when I went up there the year I went to the Northwest. All right, and Paula wants to know where and when they can be seen. And Terrence wants to know that too. And I think we're gonna have, we will be asking Hannah and Eric that because I did a very bad job of finding them when I went up there, so. <laughs> Next. All right, so this week in Florida birding, uh, we have some different, it, Last week was like so much was going on and June is here. So things change in June. So here's some really nice photos from um, actually both are from Shauna Resnick. Um, that was a, I, I didn't update my slide deck here. Anyways, uh, she got these black neck stilts having some kind of dispute. And those of you that go on the wildlife drive have noticed they're just everywhere. They're just so much fun to watch. And then here's a great blue heron eating an alligator. 
So you never know what you're going to see, even even though you know birding's kind of slow this time of year. Um, these are some kind of cool things you always want to look for. And so we've started June challenge, some of us, and we thought we'd highlight a few things. So these are things from myself and Susan and Gail and Jennifer. We've been visiting some places. So the upper left is a red cockaded woodpecker from Hal Scott Preserve, which is way in the southeast part of Orlando. It's way out there. <clears throat> and then on the bottom left is a cliff swallow, which is out near Christmas, the St. John's River Bridge. Uh, they actually are some breeding under there. And then we have the Florida scrub jay. So we took a nice walk into the Florida scrub today out at uh, Rock Springs Reserve to see those. And then here are some highlights from Lori, who's doing Seminole County. And she was very excited to find that short-tailed hawk. That's a light morph because those are, those are here, but you know, you just have to be at the right place at the right time. She's got some nice photos there of the limpkins with the apple snail. We have a singing summer tanager and a loggerhead shrike on a fence. Really cool birds. So now we're gonna turn it over to Hannah and Eric and they're gonna talk about their podcast. And um, just as a little introduction here, um, if you've never listened to a podcast, it, I highly recommend it, whether I do it when I'm driving, like to my birding adventures or other places. It's just, it's different than listening to the radio and all the depressing news. I learn about birds. Um, they're lots of fun to listen to. And what's really cool, they used to live here in Florida. So some of their older episodes are featuring Florida and then there's they go on new adventures and it's just a lot of fun to listen to them so that we'll talk to you about how to get on a podcast because if you're not familiar with that and you can also listen on your computer too so I'm going to let them share and turn it over to them and if you do come up with questions just put them in the chat and then Susan will at the end we'll give some time for that all right so we're ready for you guys to share your screen or however you want to do it Okay, well, thank you all for joining us and for having us um, out for Orange Audubon. Hang on a second. I got to get myself all set. I know how to do it. I know. I know. <laughs> okay. Maybe I don't know how to do it, Eric. I'll say it's you okay. were right. Yeah. See? There we go. <laughs> it's going. It's working. It's working. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Well, Maybe yeah, like a screen. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for having us. Um, yeah, we we did live in Florida for a little while, and I constantly say to myself, I wish I was still back in Florida. <laughs> Eric can can attest to that. It's, but I don't know. It's it's pretty warm down there right now. So. <laughs> it is. <laughs> So we're um, on the Oregon coast where you can see Tufta Puffins. And I, I know um, some folks asked about when and where. So we'll just get that out of the way while I still have it in my mind. Um, so we do have Tufta Puffins that nest here where we're at in Cannon Beach, Oregon. And the best time to see them is April through August when they're here breeding. Um, the rest of the year, they're out in the ocean doing what they do. And one of the fascinating things I think about tufted puffins is that there's very little research about what they're doing when they're out at sea and so there's a lot of scientists right now who are trying to tag them and get research um, going about what's happening when they're out at sea um, other than just floating on the the water and eating fish um, so yeah it's it's cool that in these days you know there's still a lot we don't know about some of our you know species that we see pretty regularly yeah, there's nine months out of the year that we have no idea what they are doing or where they're at wow so um can both of you share what got each of you interested in birding sure so um do you want me you, to start you can start yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> so it's inadvertently this little bird right here, which is a dark-eyed junco. Um, I went to Oregon State University, which is you know one of the larger universities in Oregon. I was working on my bachelor's in natural resource management, and that required that I took a class in either um, 
fish, the studies of fish, studies of bird, or studies of mammals. And it just worked out that birds was the one that fit my schedule. And I didn't really particularly, you know, care about birds at the time. I can't even remember like my earliest thoughts about birds. Um, you know, they, sure, I knew what a robin was, but that was kind of where it was at. And my professor, who was fascinating, he had, um, he held the distinction that he had held every single living duck species in his hands. And he had like traveled to Russia to go find, you know, duck species that he could hold in his hands. He, he banded him, right? Uh, he banded him. Yeah. yeah, he was also a duck hunter. And, duck hunter, duck bander. Yeah. <laughs> and so he showed us the uh, David Attenborough series, Life of Birds, uh, to kind of, you know, kick off every single session and so that was just fascinating I'd never watched wildlife videos like that in documentaries and it was you know David Attenborough is such a fantastic speaker and he just really draws you in so there was that but also in one of the midterms I was or in the midterm I was sitting there looking at it about to get started and the first question is how does a dark-eyed junko fly and I must have sat there for like 10, 15 minutes thinking, I don't even know what a dark-eyed junko is. And I just- It happens to be this guy right here. <laughs> I was sitting there like, I'm gonna fail this class. I'm gonna, you know, have to get, I'm gonna get kicked out of college. Like, what am I gonna do now? And so I just like made up an answer and finished the rest of the test. And then I, you know, texted Eric when I got out of class and said, I think I need to go figure out what a dark-eyed junko is. So from then on, we went birding. Yeah, and I'm I'm very supportive. So I was I got into birding because Hannah was like, "Well, I need to figure out what this is." So I was like, "Yeah, let's go. All right, let's let's go figure this out." And we started going out on uh, like our own our own field trips that were separate from the class up to a couple of the hot spots. There's uh, a couple national wildlife refuges in the area, and then there was uh, a nice uh, Mary's Peak is like a a mountainous area that's uh, right next to Corvallis. So we go out there and we just go hiking and it's like, well, this is kind of an interesting way, an interesting reason to go hiking, to go specifically to go find birds. So it's like, oh, so we'll, we'll go hiking, but we'll look for birds at the same time. So then it just kind of like grew into, okay, well, now let's just go look for birds. I don't really care about the hiking. Let's go find some, okay, well, let's go over here because there's birds. Oh, we can see these birds from our car. Let's go over. <laughs> and so all of a sudden it became, let's go everywhere we can to find birds, to just make, make more and more lists, see more and more birds, see see all the cool, interesting birds, all the things with feathers all around. Very cool. Um, what are some of your favorite birding locations? And I know it's hard. It's like asking, <laughs> you know, who's your favorite child or <laughs> favorite sibling? So I picked out a couple of them and I made a little uh, photo collage here. So Eric, do you want to start off with um, any of them? So we, sure. have, we, I mean, every place we go is yeah. definitely our favorite place to be. <laughs> yeah. So in, anywhere where we can see birds. So these, these are some pictures from different places around the world that we've been that are pretty awesome. A couple of them, or I guess only one of the pictures is here in the States, but uh, that's, that's at Benson, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the, the top right picture is uh, down in the Rio Grande Valley. It's uh, one of the state parks down there, uh, Benson Rio Grande Valley State Park. This is one of their bird blinds. You have to go down this like this chute and then you kind of zigzag through it and then the, all the door all the windows for all the panes like fold down so you can fold them all up and it can be completely closed all except for one little square in the blind so it's it's a really cool modular uh blind to be in and it's it's just a spectacular place you can go there and see chachalacas and green jays and um, great kiskadees and they're just all over and they have no idea that you're there because of this like fantastic blind that they don't see you approach so you can you can walk up and they're still out there feeding the whole time so it's that's that's a really cool place to be yeah and then uh we also have down in the right corner is uh natrum fatten ricket in sweden we went to uh the the Baltic countries a couple years ago mm -hmm. in Sweden and had just a fantastic time. We, you know, didn't really know what to expect, but everyone there was just so friendly and we drove, we rented a car and drove around and that was really our first time driving um, in a foreign country. And it was just a wonderful place. And I just think yeah. all the time about how I want to go back to Sweden and I'm going to buy a little shack, you know, on the, <laughs> the coast and <laughs> be a writer. <laughs> 
Well, and, and the, the people in Sweden were just so friendly. The, the at, at this particular um, nature center that we went to, the, we, we met just some random guy that was walking down the trail. And he was like, he, he just, he was like, hey, you, you guys don't look like you're from here. What are you doing here? And we told him. And he was like, oh, you're from, you're from United States. You're very far from home, but you're very welcome here. <laughs> Um, down, at, I'm sorry, Eric has to run for a second. Um, down in the left is the Kinabatang River in Borneo. Um, we did a, a trip through Borneo a couple years ago and definitely want to go back to explore more of it, but it's just absolutely a fantastic place to go. You can see pygmy elephants there. There's storks, you know, there's tons of kingfishers. That was just uh, definitely one of my favorites. And then lastly, um, Eric on a swing up there is in uh, the Pinchincha volcano uh, that's, that overlooks Quito in Ecuador. That, that's just an amazing place to go to. It's one of the highest places that I've ever been elevation wise. And it's very difficult to breathe. And when you get up there, it's a, a tough time to go hiking, but a lot of people hike from that point up to the top of this mountain to go see um, to go see caracara species that, that live up there. And it's just an absolutely fascinating place. They have a species of hummingbird that you can only see at the top of this mountain. And it's just amazing that this little hummingbird can go all the way up there. And I'm having, I'm struggling trying to walk a hundred feet and a hummingbird can live up there. Wow, that's amazing. What, what great adventures you've been on. So, what made you decide to do a podcast? Yeah, so it's something that we had talked about doing um, for a little while before we actually started. We were living in Florida. Um, we had long weekends that we could drive around and go birding. And we would listen to podcasts while we were driving around. You know, you can't get, it's, it's difficult to drive and try to get the same radio station to hold on for enough time to make it worth it. So we were listening to podcasts. And, you know, none of the podcasts really talked about the adventure birding. And they also didn't really, they, you know, you had to have some level of birding experience to listen to some of them and really get anything from it. And so we wanted to talk about the places to go and the things that you see when you go birding for folks that maybe don't have, um, you know, birding friends that can give them these hints and tips and things. And so we bought a microphone, um, $25 microphone and left it in the car for a little while. And then we went birding at Cedar Key. And as we were birding at Cedar Key, we were, <laughs> we saw a hawk flying up in the sky and we had been in Florida for just a couple months at that time. We saw this hawk and we thought, oh my gosh, this is a zone-tailed hawk because we had had experience in living in Texas and it was a dark morph short-tailed hawk. We were freaking out about it. We were like, we found the first state record. You know, I was trying to figure out who to message to, you know, get verification of it. And then uh, finally somebody said, how did you roll out dark morph short-tailed hawk? And we were like, well, we didn't. Uh, well, we didn't. I am, I'm actually surprised that I left all of those notes on there on the, <laughs> I, I just continued adding notes, I guess, after we figured out that it was a short tail talk. <laughs> well, and I think the situation we thought was so funny that we had, you know, we spent hours thinking we found the first state record and we were so excited, so excited. about it that, you know, we thought like that was a fail and, you know, it's okay to fail in science. And so we wanted, our first episode is our journey out to go fail by um, mistaking this bird and getting all excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> just to show it's okay to be wrong. Absolutely. That's, that's what it's all about. So how has your podcast evolved over time? So I think a lot of our podcast, it's so most of our episodes, I think the general format really hasn't evolved um, too much. We, we, we kind of will add a segment and see, see how it does or see how comfortable we are with it every once in a while and then pull it out or just small, small things here and there um, for a large amount of time, I guess, probably 20 or 30 episodes or so we were like talking about the beer that we were drinking while we were recording the episode because we love we love craft beers and so we we're like oh we talk about this and then it just kind of was like oh, I don't know so we it, we kind of drifted off of that but uh the general uh um co composition of the episode has stayed fairly consistent uh, we talk about uh places we go things we do and people we meet and uh, just cool, just cool adventures that we go on. Um, the first couple episodes are shorter, and then we kind of fell into a groove, getting closer to forty-five <laughs> minutes to an hour. 
and then we kind of had to start cutting ourselves off and like okay now we have to we, we started getting a little a little extra long and longer than people's commutes so we were like we, we can't we can't have something that lasts longer than somebody's commute to get to work so we gotta we gotta cut this down they're really nice on long trips let me tell you <laughs> really nice so what do you hope to accomplish with your podcast i think i have a slide about that um so yeah those are some yeah, yeah. So um, part of what we hope to accomplish is to, like I said, tell people about some of the places that you might go that they don't know about. So this big picture that I have is a Canada J at Zaxumbog. And that's somewhere where we went in February in Minnesota. It's negative 40 degrees. It's I think it was only negative 35 when we took the picture. Though. It's horrible. Um, and it's also a very complicated place to bird. So we'd heard about it from, you know, people posting on Facebook and people telling us like oh you should go to Zaxxon Bog but we had no idea how to go birding there and when we got there we had no idea it's it's like I said it's complicated it's like a 20 20 mile by 20 mile section of bog a frozen bog intermixed with public and private um look you know spots mm -hmm. and a bunch of gravel roads a bunch of a handful of paved roads just kind of like a big grid of roads and wetlands and had we, together had we gone there birding by ourselves we would have been really frustrated and not been successful and so one of the things that we want to do with our podcast is to tell people about these places and you know give suggestions of how to bird so they are successful when they get there we also hope to introduce people to places that they want to go like that and people they might want to meet and things that they can do so there's a lot of opportunities in birding that's um, outside of just you know birding in your backyard or birding you know in your local areas there's festivals like the Rio Grande Valley Birding Festival that we go to pretty much every year there's competitions like that middle right picture is my team for the champions of the flyway in Israel um, that I was supposed to be a part of the, <laughs> the first all women's uh, international COVID. team last year but next year we're gonna do it and then people like in the bottom right we are with Julia who is a woman guide out of Mindo Ecuador there's just so many opportunities out there and we hope to share you know those different things with folks that, that might not be aware of all the, the cool things that exist in the birding community. Yeah, and, and kind of uh, demystify some of the inner workings of like the birding community that if, if you're looking from the outside, you, you don't have any idea how, how do people get to know each other? How do pe people get to learn birds? All of, all of those things that for newcomers to the, to the birding community, they just don't understand. So trying to just talk openly about like competitions and talk openly about listing versus being a backyard birder versus being someone that just does just their five mile radius, someone that does worldwide birding, just kind of talking about all of the different facets that, that there are to the birding community. It's not, you don't, you don't have to be a, a heavy, um, like a, a heavy hitting, like world renowned race around the world, 10,000 species birder to be a birder. You can, you can sit in your backyard and only see 15 species a year. And that's, you can still be a birder while doing that. So that, that's the sort of b barriers that we want to break down with, with what we have. Awesome. So what are you doing to keep it, your podcast fresh? Yeah, so um, going to new places, of course, is a, a great excuse for to make a new podcast. And also, we try to reach out to our visit our listeners um, to see what they'd be interested in. We uh, are pretty uh, consistent on Twitter and on Instagram and Facebook. And so we watch to see what people are talking about. And then if they have questions, like we did an episode about eBird about a year or so ago. And, you know, there are all these questions that people are having about how eBird works and how being a reviewer works. And we, you know, took that, this is what the people are interested in and then created an episode based on that. Awesome. So something else that I want to interject here is Hannah has a spinoff podcast. And I know a lot of you are asking how to listen, because now that you're hearing about all this, you're like, I want to know how to do it. We're going to get to that. So yeah, we will definitely get to that. So Hannah has uh, created a Women Birders Happy Hour podcast. So what inspired you, Hannah, to do this spinoff? Yeah, so, um, so I've been really 
you know, into the the whole women's, uh, you know, women and birding. I'm a woman and, you know, there's a lot of times that I feel frustrated in the birding community that I have um, folks that look at Eric and ask Eric the questions and, you know, just totally blow past me. And there was also, this also happened at, right at the beginning of COVID when I started this podcast, there were a number of women um, who I kept thinking like, oh, you know, I, we should interview that woman about this. We should interview that woman about what she's doing. And I thought like, well, you know, I want to keep Hannah and Eric go birding about adventures and about, you know, all these other things. And so I thought like, okay, well, you know, I still want to interview all these amazing women who are out there doing things. And so I created this podcast to showcase some of these amazing women. And, you know, there are, are fantastic women like Kimberly Kaufman and Debbie Shearwater. And, you know, in, in Florida, we've got Julie um, Wraithmail, who's with uh, Florida Audubon, who are doing just really cool things. But there's all these other women who are doing cool things too that we don't hear about. And so that was kind of the the reason one of the reasons why I started it. And also there were a handful of other podcasts that started at the same time. You know, everybody was stuck at home and they're like, I'm gonna start a podcast. <laughs> and uh, I, I saw a number of them get started that were men interviewing other men. And I just thought, you know, there's not enough women being asked to interview. And so I had, I hoped with my show that I can introduce everyone to these amazing women. And I also like a good cocktail. And I always thought, you know, it'd be so fun to have birding friends that we could go out birding and then we could go get a drink afterwards. Um, so that that was really how that that series got started. And it's really, it's a fun, I do enjoy it. I love that you, you find people that no one else would recognize or, or you know, bring to other people's attention. They're doing really, really cool things in all different countries. So it's great. So um, what do you hope to accomplish with your women birders um, podcast? So uh, showing off the, these amazing women who aren't necessarily getting the recognition that they deserve. And it doesn't have to be, you know, women who are doing a big year or work in a certain field or something like that. I want to show that there are women of, you know, out there who work in tech fields, who work at you know, grocery stores who are birding and part of this community. You don't have to be a writer. You don't have to be a, you know, naturalist at a park to be a part of the birding community. And there's women who are doing it as a hobby who are excellent at it and also contributing a ton to it. Um, you know, we, like I said, we go to the Rio Grande Valley Birding Festival every year and it's heavily um, supported by women. Uh, many of the guides who are there are men, um, but most of the folks who put on the festival are women. And I just don't feel that they always get the recognition that they deserve for it. So I really just hope to, you know, introduce you all to these women and hopefully, you know, get, get them speaking jobs if they're interested in, in getting speaking jobs or guiding, but just help them to tell their story, whether that's good, bad, um, if, if they want to discuss about abuses that they face in the community or, you know, highlight these really cool things that have happened to them. I think all of those things are really important and we need to talk about the, some of the difficult things too to improve the community for others out there. That's wonderful, Hannah. That's really wonderful. So um, coming, bring this back to Central Florida. So you have a Central Florida connection or Florida connection because you used to live in Florida. So what, uh, now that you live in Oregon, what do you miss most about Florida <laughs> beside the obvious? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I miss being able to go, go out in the winter and get a bird list of like 40 species. <laughs> You, you can't do that in, in Oregon in the winter. And I put on here a couple things that I miss. I miss the birds. Ibises, you know, are so much fun to watch and we got to see them all over the place. And the Lincolns. And the Lincolns, yeah. <laughs> so lots of birds, um, the amazing wildlife, you know, that's out there, like the snapping turtle that we happen upon at the, um, uh, the National Wildlife Refuge in Port Canaveral. The one that I'm going to forget its name. Uh, but you all know what I'm talking about. And hey, then, you know what we're talking about. 
I miss the springs, the beautiful clear water, you know, that's 70 degrees all the time. That is just absolutely fabulous. And then I put down here, Robert is here because I mentioned that to every single person that says they're going to the Everglades. You have to stop at Robert is here and get a milkshake because they are phenomenal. Wow, never heard of that. Oh gosh, it's, oh, it's, it's the it's best good. fruit stand ever. It's, right. it's a giant, giant fruit stand kind of in the middle of just farming nothingness out uh, just was it just west of uh, Orlando. No, it's or, Everglades. Sorry, M Miami. Yeah. Know. Just just west of Miami. Well, we'll be we'll be looking for that if we go to South Florida for sure. OK, so switching it up, um, what's your favorite thing about living in Oregon in the Northwest? So definitely the Tufted Puffins um, is a favorite. They are just a charismatic, fascinating bird that people come here from around the world to see, which I think is just so cool. You know, it's like Limpkin in Florida. People come from around the world to see this one bird that you guys have. Well, I mean, dozens of different species that you that are in Florida that are cool. Um, and also just the, the super neat wildlife that we see, this picture of the elk uh, with the car behind it, that's right outside our back door. This is bottom, the little white line you can see at the bottom is one of the stripes for our parking lot. Wow. And it's like right here. <laughs> yeah. That's really so cool. Those are a few of our favorite yeah. things. <laughs> and we, we don't really have any pictures of uh, Haystack Rock, but I mean, you can you can find tons of pictures like the, just the picturesque like mount it's like mountainous and forested and ocean all all together right in one little one little pocket of area the world of the world yeah that's fantastic um what are some new adventures that you guys are planning so we kind of were working out what our schedule is we we try to schedule things um a couple months in advance of what we plan to do. Mm -hmm. um, we just got on with the Southeast Arizona Birding Festival in August. We'll do two walks there. And then we also are with the Birding Co-op. We helped to found um, the Birding Co-op. So we're board members. And that's a nonprofit organization that we started with a couple of friends to change the way that, you know, birding tours work and to help communities that we go to. And so we'll be at the, the Southeast Arizona Birding Festival to to guide as well as um, do like social events and things like that for the birding co-op. Yeah, and then uh, in November, the Rio Grande Valley Birding Festival, maybe we're going to Costa Rica in December. I don't, I don't know, we'll, we'll see. Um, and then we've got a, a really fun adventure that we're really looking forward to. Hannah's been talking about for years, um, going down to South Africa. There's a, a cruise out of uh, South Africa that goes, it's called the um, Flock to Marion. Once in a lifetime cruise with um, Bird Life International South Africa. Yes. Be going on. As it's, it go, it's just a cruise that goes from one side of South Africa to the other. It doesn't really go anywhere, just one side of the country to the other, but it goes out to this island, this Marion Island that um, is inaccessible, that they've um, eradicated the, um, the, the, mice. Mi the mice that were, uh, the invasive mice that were brought out to the island. And so it's just kind of, it's a, it's a bird trip on a, on a full-size cruise ship, completely full of birders um, going down around the, the Cape Horn. Yeah, yeah. Cape Horn, <laughs> down, down around the bottom of South Africa there. So really looking forward to that. And we're also doing that as part of a rock jumper trip. That was the only way we could figure out getting on the cruise was to take this trip through rock jumper. Because it was magically sold out, even though it's a full size cruise ship full of only birders, it's <laughs> sold out. And there's four spots left on the rock jumper trip. So <laughs> if anybody wants to go. <laughs> And then, um, you know, fingers crossed that we can go to Israel for the champions of the flyaway this year. Um, so I can be part of the first international all women's team to participate in that. And we can go around uh, Israel in 24 hours and see how many birds we can find. Wow. That sounds cool. Well, okay. So let's see. Um, I know that Susan is we've got some questions i know a big one is about getting on the podcast mm -hmm. well the first one i think we had was what type of any birding trips that you have to oregon what have you been doing in oregon as far as tr birding trips like what are your favorite birding trips in oregon what places 
So my favorite, um, sorry, I'm going to talk to Eric. That's no, fine, go ahead. No. <laughs> uh, my favorite is to go to Bend, Oregon in May. Um, there is a woodpecker festival that happens like the first weekend in June. On on Hannah's birthday, usually. And, no, it's the first weekend in June. They switched it. Oh, they did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Never and, mind. Not on Hannah's birthday anymore. <laughs> um, but it's uh, the Woodpe Dean Hale Woodpecker Festival in Bend, Oregon. And you can see up to 13 species of woodpecker during this festival. Bend is just a fabulous place to go, like lots of good food. You know, it's um, it's high desert, so it's dry, but it's just absolutely gorgeous. So that's my favorite. Well, you took my favorite, but any Malheur. Malheur is Malheur is really good. So you go to, you go to eastern uh, eastern southern southeastern Oregon. There's uh, the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. If uh, if you followed like national news like five years ago, you probably saw about the whole Ted Bundy went there and took not it Ted over. Bundy. Not Ted Bundy. Uh, the Bundys. Uh, the Bundys. The other the other Bundy. Not not the murderer Ted Bundy. The, I mean, he was in Oregon too. Yeah, he was in Oregon too. But the, no, they're 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 the Bundy family. They they took it over and the guns and everything. It was a whole situation. Um, <laughs> They, they like lived there for like six months and like just trashed it but um but the refuge is but the great. refuge itself as if, ignoring the whole situation that happened the refuge is fantastic for birds the um it's one it's one of the number one hot spots in the state um you can you can go down there you're in the middle of the desert but it's just a lake that's in the middle of the desert that just attracts so many birds to the area so that's that's a really good trip um and it's from from where we're at oregon is not huge like it's it's, it's essentially like driving from, from one side to Florida to the other. It's about the same size. Mm -hmm. About the same number of hours. It's about drive. six hours six to hours, the yeah. Malheur from us. Oh, I guess it was eight hours to Miami. Yeah. Yeah. So it's six, six hours from one end to the other in Oregon. So that's that's a really good trip from here for like a weekend. Mm -hmm. Now, do they have any special birding puffin trips in your area? Like if anybody's like, if we're going to Oregon, is there any special birding trips? Um, not particularly. Uh, there are some people that guide. It's mostly like day trips and then sometimes um, like Rock Jumper and Vent will do trips out here. Um, but the beauty of Tufted Puffins is that you can see them from the shore and you just stand on the beach and Haystack Rock is, is pretty obvious where we're at. And so you just look in the right spot and, you know, there's actually educators that are city funded educators that stand out there and they can point them out to you. And we are always happy to show anyone Tufted Puffins. So if yeah. you want to come out, we can, would be happy to walk down to the beach with you and show you. So it's only a half mile from where we're sitting. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> cool. nice. Now somebody did ask, what is Rock Jumper? Oh, I'm sorry. It's a um, it's a guide company. It's like uh, Vent is one. Uh, Vent is Victor Emanuel Nature Tours. Uh, Rock Jumpers. Um, they're a it's there. It's just another um, one of the companies. There's there's a whole bunch of them, tropical birding and uh, wild side. Yeah, wild side's a big um, one. You could just it, Google it if you were yeah. interested in any of those. Oh yeah, yeah, and and they're all they're all essentially the same. It's just who's the guide. And yeah, they offer different tours. <laughs> they they offer different tours in different places, but they're they're all it's just a bunch of guide companies. Oh, that's good. Now people want to know how do we listen to your podcast? And I'll you know what I'm going to start sharing my screen so I can get that one slide up. Let me try that. Let's see if I can find it. Give me a moment here. I know I listen to on my tech. Here we go. Let's see if I can get the chat open. Let's see here. Is it working? Hang on. Here we go. Okay. Google Slides. Well, <laughs> hold your breath. Oh, here is loading. Okay. So let me go here. And there we go. Okay. So we'll let you tell them, um, Hannah or Eric, that I've got it up on the screen. So there's a number of different podcasting apps that you can download on. I have an Apple phone um, and there's just a, uh, one of the apps it's called podcasts. And if you click on any of those and type in Hannah and Eric go birding, um, 
usually actually just Hannah and Eric, it'll pop up <laughs> as one of the options. We have um, about almost 80 episodes at this point, and I don't really know if there's like a good place to start. Kathy, you started listening to us recently, so I don't know if you have an opinion about how to start listening to us. Um, but you can also just go into Google and type in Hannah and Eric Goberding. Our website pops up and, you know, all the different podcasting services pop up as well. So, or you can go to our website, which is on that page, gobertingpodcast.com. And um, we have players on our website. So you can actually just listen to it straight on our website. Or if you are on Facebook, you can follow us on Facebook and we post when a new episode comes up and we'll usually post one. I usually post Apple podcasts since that's just what I have on my phone, an app or the, the link to it. If you click on that on our Facebook, then it should direct you straight to that podcasting app. Yeah. And what I guess when I found it, cause that's what I would do. I would search birds, you know, on the podcast. Once I found out what a podcast was, and theirs was one of the first ones that came up and so I listened to a recent episode and since I was driving a really long way and I didn't want to have to keep switching things out I guess I started like at the earliest and then it just kept playing you know then it was playing forward and I was really happy you know I love hearing all their adventures but it was really cool to hear about some local places like Orlando Wetlands Park that was one of their episodes it was neat to hear them interview some people I know and then you know, um, see it a different perspective. So yeah, there's all different ways, but their, their recent episodes are really good. And right. Uh, was the last one you were talking about Texas or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the last, uh, so we, we just released an episode today, but, um, the two episode, the last two episodes before that were both about, uh, um, Texas. So we did, uh, one about the, um, Rio Grande Valley area that we, we birded in, um, a couple weeks back. And then, uh, the, episode before that was all about uh, the great texas birding classic so we we can we compete in a competition every year down there in texas so very cool yeah so just you yeah, just give it a try if you've never done this you're going to find it's a whole different way to travel in your car and it's <laughs> it's it's relaxing it really is and you'll you'll learn a lot along the way but warning you're going to then really get the itch to travel and be like ah, i want to go to this place yeah now, Deborah also wanted to know, is there anything as far as, I'm assuming she means birding spots in the Columbia Gorge or? Um, we haven't done a whole lot of birding in the Columbia Gorge. So well, there's the place that we stopped at. It was like just at, as you enter the gorge was, um, by Hood River. There was, a, there was that park that was pretty good. The, oh, the, um, oh, what was it called? The Deschutes River Park? Yeah, the Deschutes River Park. Desch yeah. yeah, the De Deschutes River Park, which is um, at the mouth of the Deschutes River as it comes into the Columbia, is a real, it's a really good spot. The um, the Deschutes River at that point, it's pretty, it's pretty big, but it fans out into a big flu um, fluvial plain. Is that, sure. Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. Yeah. Um, it, it, it spreads out um, and that whole area right at the mouth of the um, Deschutes becomes like a big, a big flat, almost like a wetland area. And you're kind of in the middle of like a desert area surrounding it. So it's like a little oasis for birds. So we, we went there in, what time of year was that? That was September. September. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was a, it was really good birding and the, the weather was really nice there because it's, it's, it's still kind of almost part of the high desert area slash gorge area. So it's the weather in the winter, it gets super cold up there, but like in the spring and fall, spring, fall and summer, it's pretty nice in that area. Yeah, and we tend to go to national wildlife refuges and state parks um, because we, you know, we know what we're getting generally when we go to those places and we know there's going to be a bathroom of some sort and, um, you know, pretty good habitat mm -hmm. and that just ends up being what we like to do. Um, I know in Florida, there are a lot of wildlife management areas, so we did go to a handful of those when we were there. We did get run out of one by horse flies. <laughs> Um, so I don't think we really talked about that one since we drove in the car filled up with horse flies and we drove right out and tried to fan them all out. Um, we opened up the trunk and we're in the hatchback trying to drive with the trunk open. Like, oh, this, <laughs> this is awful. We can't get these things out of here. But there's a, definitely a ton of great ones in Florida besides that, besides the horse flies. <laughs> we definitely relate to that. I think we're getting to that season right now. <laughs> I don't yeah. miss that. Yeah. Terrence also wanted to know, 
he says he's always wanted to see Haystack, Haystack Rock in real life. And he wants to know, is it hard to get to? No, here, here, so there's two, there's two Haystack Rocks in Oregon. This is the better one, the one that we're at, um, because it has tufted puffins that you can actually see with the naked eye and with binoculars pretty easily. Um, it's really easy to get to. Um, if if you don't uh, if you don't walk so well on the beach, um, there's a parking lot. There's a parking spot. There's like three spots that are right uphill from the rock that you can park in, and you can literally stand from where you're standing in your car and use binoculars and look right at the rock and and see puffins and see everything on the rock. Um, a good good set of stairs to go down if you're going there. Um, but if you're if you're fine walking on the beach, walking on the hard sand, it's about a half mile to walk um, from the parking lot. Yeah, and it's just through the sand. Um, and if you get there a low tide, you can see tide pools and sea anemones and all that cool stuff and really good looks at Haystack Rock. Um, Lori, the nearest town to our Haystack is Cannon Beach. And uh, Haystack is actually kind of in the middle of Cannon Beach. And we were named after a ship cannon. So it's Cannon, like C-A-N-N-O-N. -N. Very good. And Terrence also wanted to know the the other podcast, I'm sorry, we just put Hannah and Eric in, but I can type in um, in the chat the name of your the woman's podcast. Yeah, it's called Women Birders and then Happy Hour in parentheses. I was kind of in the middle of trying to figure out whether I wanted to change it a little while ago and called it call it the woman behind the binoculars, but everybody seemed to like the title that I currently have. <laughs> Yeah. I think the title you have is, is reflective. <laughs> I know. I know everybody would listen to women behind the binoculars and be like, why is she making cocktails? <laughs> <laughs> and I like how you relate it to different birds. Like you come up with stuff that matches whatever, you know, species is being talked about. It's a great challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I, bet. I bet. Right. So I almost put for mystery bird, I must put your tufted puffin cocktail on the first. And I was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I didn't see that one. <laughs> uh, That's cool. All right. Any other questions? Now, I have a nephew who just moved to Seattle. So I'm hoping to, my sister is a big time birder from Ohio. So I'm hoping to get that way and, um, get back there. I've been there once, but I'd like to go back and love to see more tide pools and you know that. So. Well, April is a great time to come out here. Um, it's pretty busy with tourists most of the, the summer. But so, most of the good time to see the puffins, it's crazy busy out here. Yeah. So April and beginning of May is a fantastic time. Oh, see when I was up in, um, Washington Peninsula, they said that was a bad time because they had no tours, but I guess you have to go out on a boat to see their birds. And yeah. they, they said, no, there's no tours now because it's nesting season. And I was like, oh, you know. Yeah, that's, that's the beauty of Haystack Rock here is um, you, you don't have to do anything that disturbs the birds to see them. They're, the Haystack Rock is 235 feet tall and they nest at the top of it and you can't get to within like 200 feet of the base of the rock anyways. So they're, they're w well over 500 feet away, way up there. And huh. so it's, it's not great for photography, but <laughs> you, but they're there and you can see them and you can get great looks with scopes and binoculars. So you don't even need a scope necessarily. Yeah. You don't, you don't need a scope. Yeah. You can, they'll, they'll, they'll fly when they're feeding They're they'll fly in and out of their burrows and they'll fly right over the top of the beach. Like, 50 or 60 feet above your head just whoosh. yeah sometimes they'll like drop water on you as yeah. they're flying over <laughs> like the puffin splash zone yeah <laughs> it was interesting you said that they don't know a lot about them when i kind of looked onto all birds and e-bird about them it was like food is fish and i'm like that's fish. interesting because usually they put like a type of you know fish or whatever and they didn't have a lot in there about them so i thought that was kind of interesting just that they were the biggest you know and where they breed and there's actually a grad student that I, i'm on the friends of haystack rock board here and there's a grad 
student that'll be here this summer who's working on um, what they eat. And so he's trying to get photographers to come out and take pictures of them as they're bringing food back to the nestling so he can try to ID all of the different fish in their bills. Oh, that would be kind of cool. Awesome. Oh, Deborah also wanted to know what else nests on Haystack Rock. Yeah, so uh, actually not a huge number of species, but uh, some kind of interesting ones. So we've got tufted puffins that are up there. We've got uh, pigeon guillemots, um, like she, she asked also. Um, so th those are two like really kind of iconic, interesting looking birds that are up there. And then um, common murres are the most numerous species that are up there. Like Hannah said, um, I don't know if it was before we started recording or not, but um, there's well over 3,000 common murres that'll be nesting up there every single year. And then we've got three different species of cormorants that uh, hang out up there. We've got uh, pelagic cormorants, brant's cormorants, and double-crested cormorants. And then also black oyster catchers. And black oyster catchers at the base of the rock. And then they don't nest on it, but they hang out on it, the, um, the harlequin ducks. Um, we'll get them hanging around at the base of the rock. They, they just kind of like hang out hanging out in the tide pools i guess and lots of goals too so during yeah. the in july <laughs> um you'll get these giant fluffy goal babies <laughs> yeah and the the goal species are extremely difficult here in the pacific northwest the all the the laris goals the large white-headed goals they uh they all interbreed so we have um we have california goals western goals glaucus wing goals that all three interbreed very heavily um, so there's, it's just kind of a whole, who knows what's going on. And then we've got um, ring bills and mew goals, and we, we just have lots and lots of goals that are hanging out up there. Yeah, I just kind of ignore them and let Eric <laughs> divvy out what's what. It's, it's like impossible. It's like, okay, this is mostly this kind of goal. So there we go. That's <laughs> we understand the goal thing. Uh, we have Caspian terns that fly over pretty regularly. Uh, we actually have that as a yard bird, which yeah. is exciting for us. And we've had elegant terns hang out at the mouth of the Columbia River. So not, not a huge amount, but um, Two. <laughs> yeah, Caspian terns are, are a fun bird to watch. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, Oyster customers, they're cute. Yeah. And they're loud. It, like when, especially especially when they're trying to defend their nest, they're it's just like eek, eek, as they're coming up and down the beach. It's it's kind of kind of interesting, and it's it's always like you, people who ask, oh, is there are there oyster catchers here? And almost every time somebody asks about oyster catchers, you hear one start screaming. You're like, as a matter of fact, what you hear right now is an oyster catcher. Um, what kind of shorebirds do you guys get? Oh, we get a lot of shorebirds. <laughs> um, so here in Oregon, I'm not. I'm not a huge shorebird expert, but we, we get a lot of shorebirds. We have Western, Western sandpipers, least sandpipers. Um, we just had a whole giant flock of red knots, um, a giant monster flock. It was over 400 species or 400 um, individuals. individuals. That's It was a record, Oregon record setting flock um, just a couple days ago. Um, we'll get curlews and wimbrels. Wimbrels, too. curlews. Uh, lot, lot, lots and lots of shorebirds. Um, Dunlins, mm -hmm. um, black-bellied plovers, um, I think Pacific golden plovers somebody had the other day um, up near the mouth of the Columbia. Um, lot, just lots, lots and lots of shorebirds. Yeah, and unfortunately, oh, goes on. unfortunately our um, beach is, is pretty heavily tourist uh, influenced and so we don't get a whole lot of shorebirds like on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we'll mostly get gulls and crows flying around on the beach since and most of the birds that you do see are on haystack because that's inaccessible and so it's safer for all of the species um, but we will see the shorebirds every once in a while we just don't yeah not a whole lot yeah yeah you have to go to other places in the county to get them yeah we can't see them from our from our yard <laughs> you said the best months for the puffins were april through august Yep, they get here uh, just at the end of April and then they leave usually around Labor Day weekend. Um, but June through August is definitely tourist season here. So if you want to miss the crowds, then I would say like the end of April and, you know, into May, a little in, bit. Yeah, into May would be the best time to come. Okay, very good. All right. Um, and they also want to note, Terrence also mentioned, what kind of raptors do you get? 
So the cool thing at, at Haystack Rock is that we get peregrine falcons um, fairly regularly that come down and, you know, try to get some of the other birds that are on there and, and bald eagles lots too. Of, lots and lots of bald eagles. I think, I think we have like four, four nesting pairs in town. So lots and lots of bald eagles. The, the baby common murders apparently are very delicious for, for the, for the eagles. <laughs> So th those are the two main ones that we get here in, in town. Um, other places around the county, um, rough-legged hawk. Um, red shoulder. Red shoulder, red tail. Red tail um, Merlins, kestrels. kestrels. Yeah, so a lot of the more regular species. We don't get the cool ones like ferruginous out here too often. No. We don't get prairie falcon. You have, you have no. to go to central Oregon to get prairie falcon. They're, they're pretty common though. If you, if you go like over to Bend in that area, you mm -hmm. can get prairie falcon. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. I tried to find one in Ohio. I went, I think, three times. Never did see it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and Deborah wanted to know, are there oysters there? Uh, there are in certain parts of uh, on the coast. Um, oyster catchers, I mean, it's, you know, it's one of those names that they're called that, but they don't necessarily only eat oysters. Um, but there are some places like uh, south of us, about an hour is a, a town called Bay City, and it's fun to drive through there because there's an oyster bar or an oyster processing plant, and they have this giant pile of oyster shells. And it's it, like it's like 30 feet high. It's Eric, like this big giant monstrous pile of just shells. And Eric did a CBC down there a couple years ago, and he had you had like 20 ready turns. Turn, yeah, yeah ready turns. Right? At, le at least 20 that are just like milling about trying to find the scraps that are left over in the in the shells oh, very good well we really appreciate your time han and eric and i think you might have some more listeners that are going to be joining into your podcast um and i know you have a few people very interested in visiting oregon and some of the other places that you mentioned um, so thank you so much for sharing your adventure so freely and you said I really high, highly recommend both um, your uh, Hannah and Eric Go Birding and Women Birders Happy Hour podcasts. They're fascinating. They're fun to listen to, and they'll spur you on to your next adventure. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you guys so much for having us. Yeah, and if thanks. anybody has any further questions, you know we're um, we're pretty easily reachable. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Everyone joins us next week for the. Florida Big Year Adventure. So.